so I have it on tape is to get your name first and last and the spelling just so I have that. So if you go ahead and... Okay. Are you ready? Sure. Okay, George G. Phillips, P-H-I-L-L-I-P-S. Now, I learned something interesting. Now, I don't know if this is, is true or not. One of the vets told me, um, because I noticed that a lot of the World War II vets, when they write things, they'll put their middle initial. And the one guy said, yeah, all they cared about was your first name and your middle initial, because by the time they got to your last name... <laughs> that and a serial number. <laughs> <laughs> now, you're kind of a... Um, because you went in, actually, you were in before the war, is that right? Yeah. And so what, what were you doing prior to the war? You got into what? Well, I, I joined the National Guard in 1939 because I used to pay a dollar a drill. And that was big money in those days, you know, when gas was 10 cents a gallon and so on. And uh, that sounded like a pretty good deal that we go to a drill and get a buck. And uh, they pay every three months. Well, that was fine. And that lasted for about a little over a year. And then they, uh, in uh, September 16th, 1940, they federalized the National Guard. And uh, we were made, went from the 148 field artillery to 248 coast artillery. And they shipped us up to Fort Warden. And uh, we were on, what, I think a 10-inch gun up there. I had very little to do with the guns because I immediately went to radio school since I had some background in it. And I went there for six months and I liked it so well I became quite proficient at it, enough so that they put me in the main radio station, post radio station. And I worked for Sidio, San Francisco, uh, Fort Lewis, uh, Fort Ogden, Utah, and so on. It was a real high speed net. Well, uh, we're, we're, now how old were you at this time? Were you just still a kid? or? Yeah, yeah I was starting to shave, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, uh, somewhere along the line after a year or two of the service, why, uh, I decided to, my girlfriend and I get married on the thing, and, and uh, I had a radio shop on the post, and uh, I also did uh, skate boy at the ra roller rink and whatnot, you know, anything to make a buck. So uh, I decided that $54 a month, and I was a corporal by that time, and uh, it, it wouldn't make it. I couldn't get married. So uh, I looked around for some way to get more money, and... Uh, I decided I'd go to OCS if it killed me. <laughs> it darn near did. But uh, and OCS is Officers Candidate School, and uh, I, I had my choice of two, three branches. I would have preferred Signal, but uh, I, I got uh, the next best thing uh, for equipment, electro, uh, radio equipment, and uh, I went to Armored Force School, tanks at Fort uh, Knox, Kentucky. And uh, I graduated in January and of uh, 43 and was uh, sent to uh, Kentucky, to a post in Kentucky. And uh, they assigned me as a communication officer in a battalion. So I immediately applied for a communication officer school and, and went there. And uh, that started my career in the, really started my career in the military. Still not married? Uh, yes, I did. I went, I flew home uh, and got married. We, in those days, we flew about 5,000 feet high, bumpity bump over the mountains. We had, we, we had quite a trip. And uh, we got married and then we trained uh, and I was, uh, sent to Kentucky to a, to a unit. And um, then uh, I was placed in a REPL depot and uh, I was picked up there and, and uh, by an engineer outfit who wanted a communication officer. Now that was out of branch. 
So I, I, I went along with the gag until we got overseas, and then I, I looked up the former colonel I had, and, and he put me back in an appropriate branch. So, when you say overseas, where did you? Oh, uh, believe it or not, I went over in the Queen Mary, and uh, I, I didn't know for quite a little while what ship I was on because we just came out of a out of a blackout in New York and into a hole in the side of a big ship, and and uh, for some reason I kind of lucked out. Uh, they said everybody to the right, keep going to the right. But when they came to me, and I don't know whether I had blackheads or what, but uh, anyway, they sent uh, sent me to the left, and I ended up uh, living with the any aircraft crew on on the Queen Mary. And uh, we we zipped across. One one night we had uh, uh, a light appear on one side of us, and then a light appear on the other side, and the old captain just gave her the throttle. And uh, we zipped through. That thing would do about 32 knots, so it would uh, just about outrun a torpedo. So, okay, just about. <laughs> just about, yeah. <laughs> and uh, when we got to Greenock, Scotland, why, uh, of course, there wasn't any docks to handle a ship that big. It was, what, 1,100 feet or something. And so we lightered uh, ashore, went on a, got into a side loading. Uh, British train, tr uh, troop train, and away we went. And uh, I stayed in, in England for uh, about six months, and we were waiting for the build up. And, and they sure had equipment over there. It's a wonder it didn't sink the island, you know. <laughs> you know I assume it was just active. I mean, things oh, coming, it, moving. And oh, it was, it was turmoil everywhere. But uh, I didn't have much chance to cruise around, you know. I was supply officer also, so I wandered around picking up supplies and I got to see a lot of things. But then uh, uh, our unit was uh, bigoted. That bigoted, a bigot at that time was a code word that meant that you were were informed of the a forthcoming invasion, had the information. Well, I wasn't bigoted. I, I was a second lieutenant at the time, and just about to make first lieutenant. And uh, I, I happened to be out on the road uh, in front of the uh, post, at Martin Stacy, England, and uh, here came a, a convoy of tanks on on. Uh, flat uh, cars, and they had tarps over them. And I thought, gee, that's kind of funny. I mean, why do you cover up a tank? You know, you can tell what it is, a gun sticking out there. So uh, one of the flaps was loose on the back. And uh, I looked under, uh, it was going by, and I, I looked in as he, as he went by, and there was a propeller on it. And I thought, on a tank? So I, I ran into uh, the S3, Major Treadwell, and uh, this was 3rd Armored Group. And uh, Major Treadwell grabbed him by the scruff of the neck and he yanked me into a room and he says, you never saw a propeller on a tank. Do you understand? Said, yes, sir, I understand. <laughs> What it was, was a, a method of, of uh, getting tanks ashore without uh, having a 300-foot ship uh, load them on the beach see, and be subject to all the fire and, and uh, of the artillery, German artillery. So did they, were they set in something or they actually made them amphibious tanks? They, they, were amphib they had uh, flotation devices around them and uh, the, the exhaust up and... And uh, it would have been probably successful, except that we had uh, uh, about a four-foot chop, and uh, they didn't they didn't fare too well. On it. I, I never saw another tank with a propeller on it after that. 
I, uh, the, the ones that were bigoted were sent over to Normandy. We landed on Omaha Beach and uh, uh, we put the tanks in at uh, H plus one, which is pretty, pretty close to zero hour. And uh, I came uh, uh, a short time later on a 300 foot ship and uh, when, when I climbed aboard that, that LST in England, Portsmouth, why uh, they, we, we'd been up since oh, two, three o'clock in the morning, you know, getting in line and doing all these things. And I was pretty tired, so uh, I, I had no idea when they were gonna kick off anyway. So uh, I went to the communication officer, and I figured he'd be on duty, and uh, maybe I could use his bunk. And sure enough, the only trouble was he was also a junior officer, <laughs> and uh, I got in his I got in his bunk, which was the top bunk. And it was about 18 inches between uh, where you lay and uh, where the top of the uh, deck was and uh, of course I had to take my helmet off and I got up in the bunk and was sound asleep just really sawing logs <laughs> and uh, the anti-aircraft gun went off we were on the beach at that time and uh, man I hit my head I, I had a bump on my head I could have hung my helmet on you know and I, I staggered down I thought well I got a candy bar in my in the Jeep, so I'll go in and get a candy bar. And the uh, there was an air raid right then. And uh, I looked out. They they dropped the front of the, the the tide was out, presumably enough to unload us. And uh, I I was told to get that vehicle out of here now. And they they were scared of the gas. We had full tanks of gas, and uh, we pushed off. And the ramp was steeper than normal because apparently there was a shell hole or something there. I don't know whether it was a fresh shell hole or an old one, but but anyway, the the ramp was too steep, and uh, I, I think the first vehicle off was a dental truck. <laughs> the they invasion of Normandy, yeah, but. Uh, Anyway, we, we got on the beach, and we, we powered our way out of there all right. Uh, the, the bumper stuck, but it powered out the hole. And uh, we waited just momentarily for some of the others to start forming a convoy. And we started taking off, and I had no idea where to go. I wasn't bigoted, so I didn't have any information about the area I was in. I was absolutely running dumb blind and uh, I saw some trucks leaving the beach so I figured well obviously there must be a road and I went up there and uh, the convoy stopped ahead of me and I, I talked to uh, the driver I said what uh, where's this convoy going he says to the front and I said, what kind of convoy is it and he says ammunition <laughs> I didn't think that was where I wanted to go right then so I looked over to the left, and there was a little tiny faint flashing arrow pointing. You know, it it it'd blink about every uh, two or three seconds. And uh, I went over and looked at it, and there was some American writing on it, so I figured it was ours. <laughs> and uh, I went in probably two or three hundred yards, and there, all it was was a little pup tent. And uh, I identified myself, and he says, "Well, that's where you're supposed to be." He says, scatter your vehicles and camouflage them and, and uh, we'll take care of you in the morning. And so we did. I put up shrimp nets that night and we got all ready. First thing in the morning, here, here comes a ME-109 down the beach ch chugging up sand, you know. It scared the heck out of us. We hit the foxholes two or three times. But that, that was all the activity there was. So it... <clears throat> It's in it because so all these crafts are coming in 
<laughs> Go up in their front, all these trucks are piling off, and it's like being on the highway out here at 5 o'clock not knowing where everybody's going. No sign. About like finding this uh, building D here. <laughs> <laughs> Just about the same. Wow. You know? And uh, Now, did you have the faintest idea what you were getting into at this point? Well, I kind of had, uh, from war movies, I had an idea what war was. Uh, I hadn't had any, I had been in artillery in the National Guard and we had fired 75s. So I knew it was a noisy little thing. And then we'd fired uh, our 12 inches up there, uh, up at uh, Fort Warden. And incidentally, you can see that shell going out you can, until it disappears about 10 miles out. <laughs> so the truck that you were driving, was it one of the... Um... I wasn't driving. Oh, you were, but the, the truck that you were in was it one of the like dual axle canopy trucks or what? Jeep. Jeep. So it's just a yeah, we, seven Willys type Jeep. And... Yeah, but, but it was uh, waterproofed. Uh, we had uh, all the vehicles waterproof because we knew we might get wet. I didn't know how wet, but <laughs> put that thanks to that hole, I got lots of wet. And they, they made us wear this gas-proof underwear, which was very itchy, and it uh, was gas-proof, I guess. And uh, it was terrible stuff. We tried to, every way in the world to boil that stuff out of there, and it, uh, we finally ended up throwing it away, you know. So gas, flammable gas-proof. Hopefully they wouldn't burn, is that? No, the... no, I think it's uh, for mustard gas or... Uh, Protect your skin, then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We we didn't know what we were going to run into. You, you were at the point where you would take the mustard gas over the itch. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I was that desperate. Yeah. <laughs> I, I itched too long. But uh, we we stayed about uh, six seven weeks there on the we we lived in a place called Cerisi Foray. There's a picture in my. Uh, memoirs there that uh, shows the terrible devastation. There was, uh, there's, Cerisi Foray uh, had five roads coming into it, and they later made it Victory Circle and, and had a roundabout in there. It was so big. But uh, the Germans ran interdiction fire in there. Interdiction fire is uh, artillery fire that's uh, uh, set out to uh, to hit a road point or a junction where somebody might be, you know. And it's just a shot in the dark. But it, there's a good possibility with all the traffic we had, there'd be something there on it. Well, fortunately for us, they were just about 100 yards to one side of our CP. Otherwise, we would have been obliterated because that, that, well, you could see the forest. There was nothing but stumps left on that thing. Eight inches, pretty powerful stuff. So when you got there, was the forest still there? And then after you'd been there, the forest was gone? Across the street. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It wow. was completely just like one of these to, these loggers had gone in and, and cleaned it out. Yeah, it was, that, that was quite a night. We got strafed one time. The, the only casualty we had, because you can hear uh, somebody strafing a long way away. And uh, he's down and he's relatively slow, and, and uh, uh, we could hear the chatter of the German plane machine guns. And so we, we do, I had an underground, I had log covers over my foxhole. <laughs> and uh, the only casualty was the Lister bag, our water bag. It was above ground, but uh, we didn't have much activity until we started out of there. How far do you want to go? This is you're doing fine. This oh. is great. So you, where did you um, head then once you started leaving the beach and? Well, we 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 went to two different places, and uh, real estate started to become precious because we were sending more people ashore than we had real estate to handle them. You know, it, it's kind of hard to to hide them in that little piece that we had, but uh, we we rapidly expanded enough, and 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 
actually the 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 landings were completely separate for for quite a little while i mean day or two and uh, they finally joined up then we got more real estate and more real estate on it well it was about that was in june june 6 and in july uh, they had operation cobra which was the uh, breakout of Normandy. And what they did was to take uh, some of the heavy bombers, 1,800 of them, by the way, and uh, they, they picked an area, uh, called, a town called St. Low. It was a fair-sized town and kind of hilly. And uh, they, the 1,800 bombers hit it a couple of times. And uh, the Germans lost about 80% of co their command, according to the commander of the German forces. Uh, in that, and the rest of them were pretty dumbfounded about it all. And uh, that's when Patton came ashore, and, and uh, he, he'd been, actually been ashore for, for a while. But uh, that's when he took off with a couple of infantry divisions and the 5th Armored Division. And uh, the 5th the fifth Armored uh, started uh, up to the north, and uh, they swung down south first, and then then out to the east, and then uh, straight north, and put a uh, they surrounded, and closed uh, at what they call Fillet Gap, little town of Fillet there, and the Germans just fought like crazy trying to keep that open because they were spilling troops going to the north, on the thing. Well, uh, they. They finally got it closed, and uh, then the uh, Fifth Armored ran about a hundred miles in eight hours, <laughs> Ch chasing them and uh, just raising cane with them. The Fifth Armored uh, was uh, the, the first ones to to uh, cross the Rhine. They were, they were the first ones to be in Germany. In fact, they went through the Siegfried Line. Uh, when they did hit it, they went right on through it. It wasn't it wasn't manned. There's was nobody there, you know. They went on through, and and uh, uh, then they we had a critical fuel shortage because now it, instead of being a you know a short distance, why we were two three hundred kilometers away, and uh, they had what they called a Red Ball Express, which was. Uh, uh, supply units and they had one-way roads and they'd uh, 24 hours a day solid just highballing it you know and uh, night and day and I, we were we were in we oh I, I should say that at that time I was was still with third armored group I wasn't with fifth armored and uh, I'll tell you the difference in, in units. Uh, an armored group has separate tank battalions, and they're an entity under themselves. And it's a t uh, typical application of a separate tank battalion is to attach it to an infantry division for uh, reinforcement, attack, uh, defense, or whatever. Uh, the, the difference with a, a division uh, everything's organic. They're self-contained within within themselves. They've got uh, their their own engineers, they their uh, own uh, uh, artillery, and of course tanks. And and uh, the Fifth Armored Division was unique in that they had what they called married companies. Uh, company A of the infantry and Company A of the tanks would. Uh, fight together. They'd, when they uh, would run into an obstacle, uh, the, the company uh, infantry company commander would dismount some troops, and the and the uh, tank uh, company commander would get his tanks all in position, and then attack as a force, like this. Wow, that had to be just devastating. Oh, it was beautiful to see. Beautiful to see, really. And, uh, is it like, because my perception of war, unfortunately, is, is movies, 
is it like you see in the movie where if you're standing there and you're looking and you're able to watch all this going? I mean, you're seeing tanks and the soldiers, or is it so spread out that it's really little pieces, or is it just this big mass of? No, the, I think. Oh, they they do have mass attacks, but a but a mass attack may be only one road wide. But there may be a lot of roads. Now, for example, we'd go down the road uh, on the ground. Uh, our com our combat command. Now, a combat command is one third of a division. There's combat command A, B, and R. And the, the R is a misnomer because I was in it, and uh, R led a lot of the time. <laughs> but uh, the uh, The, t the combat commands would be tailored to whatever the uh, attack uh, the, the commander felt was necessary. Maybe it was to have more flank protection so they'd run people out like this and, and take this road and take this road. And just All you're doing is going down it until you run into something. Uh, then all hell breaks loose because the we had... Uh, when, when you're leading, like we led the Ninth Army from uh, the Rhine to Hanover, and when you're leading, you have air support. And we had uh, four P-47s over us all the time. Uh, there were two being gassed and two on the way and two there, you know, and then they'd, they'd just go like this the whole day. And uh, when we'd run uh, across a problem, uh, if air was the best answer, then the, we had a, a West Point officer in a light tank that had air ground communications, and he'd direct them in. And uh, being a flight officer, he knew the best path to take by personal observation of it. Was that pretty good communication? Oh, it was good communication. I mean, did, did you feel that, that you were in an environment that somebody was in control of, or did was there chaos? It sounds like there was good control. Oh, we had good control on a thing. Now, that was my job in, in CCR. I had about 30 radio operators, but they were assigned to sections. You know, I, I didn't, they were trained, you know. They'd fought uh, clear across Europe to, to Germany, and so they, they were trained, and, and they were cryptographic operators, all of them. And... Uh, Let's see, I had a couple of wire teams and a message center and, uh, oh, I don't know how many troops I, I had in my communication section. Uh, one of the things we had to do, uh, and then our colonel insisted on it. Now, bear in mind, this colonel was, I think, one of the best. And uh, he had fought in World War I. He'd fought in the Germans in uh, Africa, and now he was fighting them in Europe, and he was mad. <laughs> Too many Germans, you know, they keep coming. <laughs> so he was a very skilled commander. And when, when I joined the organization, uh, I joined with the senior staff officers, S1, S2, S3, S4, and myself as communication officer. And uh, he, uh, he introduced himself and, and uh, explained what uh, he expected of each one of us. And uh, he had it all figured out, believe me. And uh, my job was to cut communications, and that was to prevent the Germans. Uh, it's just like uh, our soldiers now coming through here, if they wanted to talk uh, from this building to... Uh, half a mile over there, they'd get on the telephone, wouldn't they? Commercial telephone. Well, that's what they had. Commercial. They weren't laying any wires. They had it. It was all in there, see? So my job was to to get in the uh, telephone office real quick, send the operators home, pull all the plugs like that, nothing worked, and have a communication blackout. And so they couldn't, uh, couldn't ambush us. And it worked. I didn't know how, how well it worked until after the war, 
the uh, the old colonel, he was so happy, he gave me a bronze star for doing it. <laughs> so you were, I mean, you were really kind of the front person in, because you had to shut that down before they could. Right. Uh, I, I, what we do, uh, my, communi my communication sergeant and I ran into some, some real hairy situations, but uh, what uh, we finally adopted is standard procedure. There, there are, there's the recon out, and there's aircraft overhead, and, and there's a, usually a, a Piper Cub uh, artillery plane looking for something to fire at. But uh, then there's five tanks, and that's called the point. And uh, it's uh, led by a, a, a lieutenant platoon leader. And uh, uh, he's expected to run into trouble, and generally does. You know, if somebody fire, fires at him and he ducks behind something, you know, and, and uh, figures out a plan of attack. Well, it, uh, it got a little hairy at times, uh, but we would move up when, just as we were approaching a town, and uh, we'd move up right behind the, f the, f the fifth tank. Now, one, one of the places that gave us the, the worst trouble was sniping. They'd snipe at us from the forest on the side. Well, uh, Colonel Anderson took care of that. He had the, 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 there's five tanks. Each one has a 50 caliber machine gun and uh, they would spray continuously the forest with 50, cal uh, 50 caliber fire and uh, a 50 caliber would go through a tree, you know, this small little trees like they had, go right through it. So hiding behind a tree wasn't gonna do you any good. You know, and a, and a 50 caliber is a half an inch shell, you know, and it's a slug about that long. But... Uh, so, you're, so you have this uh, kind of group of tanks moving into the town. Uh -huh. They're cleaning out the woods and all that. Now, They're spraying the, the woods, right? Spraying the woods, getting the snipers taken care of. Right. Um, and, and again, whatever's in front of them is, is hopefully retreating also. Hopefully. If, yeah. And so you're in what? If the, you're in this Jeep again still? Or you're in something Well, else? something has happened. As we approach the town, I look for a big house because I, I would prefer somebody of prominence in that town. So I look for a big house. And uh, we uh, uh, very quietly and carefully uh, tell him that we want him to get on the Jeep and show us the post op The post the post op is the post office, and in Germany, the telephone office, same place. And uh, he'd, he'd sit on the front of the Jeep. Well, it just so happened. Now, <laughs> we... we did, we didn't man the machine gun, but there was a machine gun right at his back, and it looked more ominous than it would because we didn't even charge the machine gun, see? But uh, we'd go putting through the town. Nobody ever shot at us while we were in that town. And uh, so it seemed to work. You know, we tried it on two, three towns like that, and it seemed to work fine, so we decided that uh, we'd make that SOP and, and uh, that's the way we did the rest of the war. <laughs> that, that Yank ingenuity. Yeah, there. Yankee <laughs> ingenuity. I'd go in. I'd go in there, you know. And, and of course, we looked pretty rough. We'd been pushing for several days, you know. And, and uh, he'd, he'd probably get up about four o'clock in the morning or earlier. Uh, we'd be on the road by daylight. Well, we looked pretty rough. And uh, therein lies the story, too. But uh, I'd go in, uh, the, usually the sergeant would uh, kind of keep an eye out for, for anybody around outside. And uh, I'd uh, rouse mitten, meaning get out. And uh, then I'd tell him, entreat verboten, means to entry forbidden. So go away and don't come back. And... Uh, then we go back when we've taken care of the, pulled all the plugs and everything. 
we go back to the uh, town square and kind of look for our troops. I'm not interested now in the ones up ahead. <laughs> I'm, I like the ones behind. So I go back and usually we have passed the town square. Maybe not, maybe so. And uh, uh, sometimes there's a mayor there uh, and uh, uh, maybe with an interpreter if we're lucky. But uh, I'd try to convey to him, he'd always want to know what we wanted. And I'd say, bring all your guns to the town square. Bring all of them to the town square. And uh, boy, right now things are happening in that town. And uh, the first tank that came along, and I'd have them run over the guns. And uh, you saw the picture of the, the tanks hadn't come yet. <laughs> this is the second wave of tanks. <laughs> First wave is on the on the left. <laughs> now these are this would be uh, um, just like you driving into downtown Olympia, kind of. I mean, you're driving into to, to villages, you bet. and these are average everyday people that live in the villages. We hope, yeah. And you never know what you're facing, but uh -uh. but that's a lot of what you're facing is shopkeepers, and I mean, there were people with guns and and things like that. But but so now you're. That must have been a, a, a strange experience to be, I guess it's a twofold. There's probably the fear, but also was there some of, well, these are just people, mother, children? Well, uh, you kind of you get a sense of, uh, of whether it's hostile or not. They're, they're all hostile, you know. After all, we're running down their main street, but... Uh, uh, you, you get a f kind of a feel. If, if you go into a town and there are no white flags out, and, and usually there were sheets and pillowcases and hanging out the windows all over the place. If you don't have that and things are awful quiet, go through like heck and forget about cutting communications. You know, there, there's trouble there somewhere in the form of SS or, or something. They're, they're pretty fanatical. So keep on going. So keep on going, you know, or, or skirt it or do something. But uh, I've, I've been in uh, cutting communications, and uh, one, one time I looked, up, I looked up, you know how you felt for the earthquake yesterday? That's just exactly the way I felt when I looked up and there was about six Ger Germans with rifles standing in the doorway right in front of me. You know, and I'm on my hands and knees <laughs> down there, and uh, it, it the fear only lasted a minute because my sergeant was, like I say, he kept his nose to the outside. Well, these Germans had been in a courtyard back with the with the animals, I and uh, uh, they they had come in the house and and were giving up. But uh, they didn't have their hands up, <laughs> you know. But, but a moment later, they came up like this, and my sergeant was just waving them on. So when uh, some of these uh, villages you'd go into, would you then stop for a while in a village and, and occupy the village for a while, set up communications? Or were you constantly on a move headed somewhere? Well, we, we usually have an objective, and, and, and the objective may be as simple as as far as you can go. You know, because you don't know how, how long you're going to be held up on a firefight. You know, 188 uh, properly placed could cause an awful lot of problems. One of the things that uh, I really admired is Colonel Anderson. Uh, when we were in Holland, <coughs> we were <coughs> staging in Holland, excuse me. <coughs> the staging is preparing for another maneuver. And uh, one day the colonel came over to my quarters and uh, said, uh, or called me and, and uh, said, uh, pick me up with your Jeep and we're going to take a ride. So uh, I went over to headquarters and picked up the colonel and uh, we drove up to the, I think it was the, the Holland-German border. And uh, when we got there, there was a uh, uh, poor, scared GI. Yeah, I don't think he'd taken his first shave yet, you know. 
And the poor guy, he come up and here's a here's a bird colonel with his wings flapping, you know. And uh, he, he stopped us and said, uh, you'll be under enemy observation from here on. And the uh, colonel says, well, uh, we're just going down there a little ways. Well, actually, we went, we went down there, oh, I'd say two or three kilometers. And over to our right was five American tanks, all of them knocked out, all of them in a group. And uh, the colonel said, well, I want to go over there and have a look at those tanks. And he got up on each one of the tanks and he looked through the, the hole that went clear through them. And uh, after looking at the last one, he says, well, I want to go over there. And there was, there was something over there, but it was just kind of a, maybe a turnip on the ground as far as I know. It was a little bump. We went over there and, and probably about a thousand yards, and here was a German 88. And it was in, in a, uh, what they call the optimum gun ring, OGR. And uh, in, in uh, air defense terms, that means that it is the, the circle that you put the guns so that they're, they're far enough away from any <coughs> target that they can get a full field of fire before they hit the target. Okay. Well, we went over there and there was that German 88. And the colonel says, okay, he says, I'm going to ask uh, for a, a set of maps along our whole route of advance for any of these anti-aircraft defense sites so that we don't get surprised like this again. Okay? And so uh, he did. He, uh, he called for it in 24 hours. <coughs> he had the... Uh, the aerial maps, and he set up a, a photo interpreter truck right behind him, and their job was to locate all these air defenses ahead of time. We'd get up to defilade is in where where they can't see you behind a hill or or something, and uh, uh, we'd we'd be in defilade, and we'd roll our artillery up, and, and they'd move to the side across there. Lay, lay in their aiming stakes and start laying artillery on them. Well, the difference between an 88 and, a, and a, an artillery piece is uh, the artillery piece is a high trajectory. The howitzers have a high trajectory. The 88s were in aircraft guns and they had a flat trajectory. So uh, you could sort of get in <clears throat> out of their range of fire uh, by getting in defilade. But they have another advantage, uh, which we have too, but an aircraft fire has time fire on it. In other words, they're made to, if, if a plane is coming over at a certain elevation, they know the distance to that elevation, and so they can set the timing on that so it'll explode Right, and the plane runs right into it. But uh, we we took care of the the uh, 88s that way. Worked good too. We're, saved a lot of lives, I'm sure, on the thing. I was I wasn't in the in the front more than just a few minutes <laughs> at a time. I, I was going to say, did you wonder why he had picked you to go out on this little sightseeing adventure, or uh... well? <laughs> we were starting to establish a relationship. Uh, we, we had done a little pigeon hunting together. And uh, later on, uh, he taught me how to tie flies. And uh, I went and got the roosters <laughs> so he could tie them. And uh, uh, we, he, one time he called me in and said, uh, this was after the war, he said, uh, why don't you go out and find some good fishing spots and, and we'll go work them over. Well, in the meantime, the old boy had uh, got himself a, a German, uh, I think they call it a seep. It was a floating jeep. 
and he, he and his driver would, would put around the pond. As far as I'm concerned, it was a damn nuisance because <laughs> it would disturb the fish. But <clears throat> we we caught fish. I'd, I'd go find the lakes and the streams and stuff. We'd go fish together. And this was after or during the war? After. Oh. After. Yeah, our, our relationship during the war uh, was uh, strictly business between he and, and everybody. Wonderful man, wonderful man. Now, when did you, when did you encounter the V two uh, facilities? Well, uh, after the war, we had uh, just before the end of the war, we had uh, gone up to Wittenberg. Wittenberg is uh, is famous because that's where Martin Luther pasted his proclamation on the front door of the church, and it's right on the banks of the Ob River. There was a huge, there used to be a huge bridge going over there. They blew it. We kind of wanted it, but they blew it. And uh, we were told to stay there. We, were, we, were, we had plans on, on uh, forcing a crossing on the river. Well, uh, Eisenhower said, no, we're not, we're not going to do that. And... Uh, so he said, stay in place for a couple of days. We stayed there. And then uh, there was a, a von Clausewitz uh, contemporary division that uh, they had put together up north uh, by uh, Hanover area that uh, was starting to cause a little problem because you get a lot of, a lot of troops together, they're going to cause problems just because there's a lot of troops there. And so uh, our whole division headed up that way and took care of that about a day or so. And uh, the, the war ended then. I, was, I think I was at Salisbury Airport when it happened. Inc incidentally, there was an ME-262, which was a, the first jet I'd ever seen up there. I got, so, I got pictures of it. Flying or just on the ground? On the ground, yeah. Wow. The German planes uh, kept coming into the airport out of gas, you know. And I kept trying to find a robot camera, which was in the left wing of the Falk Wolf 190. But uh, I found the holders and I found the case they came in, but I never found the <laughs> confounded robot camera. But I'd, I'd meet them coming in, you know, I'd run out there with a the Jeep and see. No camera, no. Never did get that big, beautiful lens on. Oh, man. So this is the war's over and, and German pilots still coming in, and you're out there driving with a jeep to. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's that's kind of the surreal aspect of war. One day we're at war, yeah. the next day we're not. Well, you know, <clears throat> they told us when uh, the war was over, we could drive with our lights on. I hadn't seen a light on for probably sixteen, eighteen months anywhere at all you know a little dim flashlight you know they, they got a deal that blacks out all the light on those <laughs> army flash, flashlights and that's about it and uh, when we were on convoy and after dark we used uh, the radio uh, markers radioactive uh, luminous that uh, they have on the vehicles they're they're spaced so that you can tell your distance they're, they have little marks, and you can tell their distance. Uh, one time I was, uh, I, I had problems uh, being in convoy like I was floating back and forth because uh, our unit, our headquarters, was always behind me somewhere. Well, when it got dark, you know, I could contact them by radio, all right, but... Uh, uh, we didn't want to necessarily give our positions away either on it. And uh, I had to kind of inquire around, <laughs> have you seen the headquarters of CCR? But one night I was creeping forward, jumping between tanks, you know, and, and half tracks. And the uh, half track ahead of me stopped. And something told me to get out of there now. And I, <laughs> I, I, and I was in the 
in the left lane, and the tank behind hit the half track ahead. Boy, I tell you. <laughs> war, war is hazardous to your health. <laughs> no matter who's coming. Yeah. Uh -huh. But we've had, we had some wonderful adventures. I had, I inherited a wonderful group of very well trained people, and I think they were more worried about me than I was about them because they had no idea of my communication background. And uh, when they found out why, you know, I used to have radio repair shop when I was up at Fort Warden and whatnot. And uh, in fact, I was going into that business when I got out, but no money in it. What was it like when you, when you uh, finally saw the V2s in the, the towns? And oh! Was uh, that pretty, pretty I started to tell you that uh, we hung around up there around Salisbury for uh, oh two three days, and then we were told to uh, uh, go down to the town of uh, Nordhausen. Well, the town of Nordhausen, they, the colonel sent an advanced detachment down there to take a look at it, and it, it had just been hit by about eight hundred British bombers uh, just a couple of weeks before. And uh, incidentally, they killed about uh, 800 plus uh, uh, prisoners in the in the camp, which was too bad. But but you don't know what's down there, you know. It's just like airplanes, we shoot them down and sort them out on the ground. <laughs> but uh, we were sent down to uh, Nordhausen, uh, where there is a view to. V camp, it's called Camp Dora, and uh, uh, the town was all beat up. So uh, we, ca we came back to Elric, which was about five kilometers uh, north, and we stayed there, and it was a beautiful little town uh, in the Hearts Mountains, you know, beautiful deer hunting, oh man, <laughs> I went hunting all the time. but. Uh, when we first when we first landed there, <clears throat> we bought up a bunch of uh, several German beef, ate pretty good, and uh, then Eisenhower figured we were eating up the cow herds of Germany, you know, and uh, so we had to uh, quit to quit buying the cow herds, <laughs> so. I thought, well, I'll do what I can. <laughs> so I went deer hunting. <laughs> Man, they had deer everywhere. Gosh. Uh, but uh, Elric had a uh, V2 plant, and uh, I think they had, uh, oh, I don't know, two, three, four tunnels that went in. And you got a map in there of them. And the. Uh, That Camp Dora, I, I didn't have much to do with, but uh, I guess it was a lot worse than than uh, the Elric camp. Uh, we had a lot of the prisoners that were in the area that, that they had turned them loose. The Germans had turned the, the prisoners loose. Now this was they were both work camps. And uh, they they had specialists there, uh, electricians and and uh, uh, all kinds of specialty people that would uh, put those V2s together. And uh, so it's not a death camp. It isn't like uh, uh, some of the other ones in the Poland area. But uh, these these guys. Uh, were pretty vicious and pretty mad. They'd been made slave labor for several years, and so if we didn't confine them, if we just turned them loose, they'd uh, kill Germans. You know, didn't seem to make much difference who either. So I remember one night I was, uh, you know, we we had. A, Oh, I don't know, 
40, 50, 60 of them in a, in a, in a building that apparently had been a hotel. And uh, I was standing guard outside. I was by myself. There's no problem. I always carried my 45 inside of my tanker jacket. And uh, so you wouldn't even know I was armed. I found that uh, <clears throat> the people would get real nervous if you were armed. So uh, they seem more friendly if if you didn't show any sidearm. So uh, I was standing there on a porch, and, and somebody uh, said, uh, "Now they were there, Russians and Poles," and they uh, said in English, uh, "What would you do if uh, we just walked away?" I, I tell you, <laughs> it was just like that. That uh, earthquake, <laughs> I, that, that combat fear hit me in the belly, you know, like that. And I jumped off that porch and <laughs> pulled that weapon out and cocked the thing. And I says, we're trying to get you to your homes, you know. <laughs> and uh, some of us aren't going to make it if you try that. And uh, then I call for the corporal of the guard and we got somebody else there too. But uh, yeah, that you can understand their their hatred, you know. And I could I could understand why they were doing it, but we couldn't permit it. On the thing. Well, that's interesting. That that you, you always hear about devastation like Doc and all that, but not the other extreme. Yeah, oh yeah, that's it. That, that here they are. They've been like you said, slaves for this yeah. amount of time. Yeah. They. Uh, I understand that that they had originally. They had originally had the, uh, the slaves living underground, and so many of them died of TB and other things. That, uh, and I and I think that's what those bones were, the picture of those uh, that big pile of bones out there. I think that's what they were. But uh, they were skin and bones. You know. So their job, the, these slaves were, they captured them, selected who had the knowledge. And now brought them in to make the the V two, right? To fight against right their own countries, right? Huh. One time I was uh, uh, we had, we had been in combat. Uh, the, I managed to get myself into every major battle in Europe. <laughs> I, I I got credit for for every one, but. Uh, We we had uh, oh what was I going to tell you? I had asked about them having to build the V two. Oh, fight. we were stationed in a town. We had pulled out of of Hurtgen. No, it wasn't Hurtgen. It was another fight. We pulled out and went into a little town. And of all the things, of all the places we could have picked, it was right in direct line between the launching site of the V-1s and their targets. And uh, they came over about every 15 minutes. <laughs> There's a one-ton warhead going over. Not a shot was fired. <laughs> Give it to a neighbor. <laughs> you know? Well, there there were planes up there uh, that would uh, run them down, and they traveled a couple hundred miles an hour. They're oh, they had a wingspan probably about the width of this room, and and they had a big uh, uh, pulse jet on the top. They had louvers on the front that would open to get the air combustion air, close, insert the fuel, fire, and so it actually went through the air like this, and was the noisiest thing you've ever heard. Uh, I, I stayed in the uh, military in one form or another for 28 years, and uh, uh, I was in anti-aircraft, and I, so I've, I've had the basic and advanced AA and guided missile courses, and in one of those courses, they uh, showed us a pulse jet, and uh, they had a they had a rocket sitting right outside that we'd shipped over here. <laughs> That's what we, you know, we shipped those and the engineers and everything, you know. But uh, they had a model of that that rocket. 
it was about this long. And I'm telling you, it bust your eardrums. It was inside, of course, but man, that thing was noisy. I could have dug a foxhole before that thing came, you know. <laughs> was the, the, the facility where they were building the V2s, when you saw that, did you think this is a pretty state-of-the-art facility, or was it pretty primitive? I mean, did you go, oh, boy, I'm glad we got control of this? Well, it's pretty awe-inspiring. I had seen one fired. Uh, being in armor, we're usually hanging around the front somewhere, and, and we were on one side of the river, and I don't remember what river, and they, uh, see, they could just bring them in on their carriage and then set them upright and fire them right there. So they could fire them anywhere. It's a pretty versatile weapon. Accuracy leaves something to be desired. Uh, you know, that's not a, not a pinpoint target. And it uh, travels about uh, 2,000 plus miles per hour. So uh, there's no defense against it. We did have one land in our area, and uh, it, there was a captain doing some uh, paperwork in a, in a half track. We just pulled into the thing, and uh, th that thing hit, and not too far away, and it uh, completely covered the half track with dirt, made a hole about 50 feet deep. Uh, blew a guard up on the second story of a building and deafened him. That's it. I mean, uh, how much does a V2 cost? You know, and what damage did it do? Of course, in Britain, it did, uh, you know, the town of London, they could, they could do a lot. But so you had all the buildings. Yeah, get. all the buildings and everything. Thing. But there's no defense against them on the thing. But just imagine if they had a uh, nuke warhead on them, you know. They were playing with heavy water up there in uh, Norway. Yeah. Yeah. Now you, it sounds like as you went along uh, and came in, you were capturing Germans? Oh yeah, <laughs> did we ever, yeah. So what, what do you do when you capture a German? I mean, you're on the move and you're dragging them along with you, or what do you do with German prisoners? <laughs> we sent them to a PW camp. There's troops behind that uh, have been brought over for the purpose of running those things, you know, and uh, they're they're not battle experienced, and and uh, oh, they run a PW camp. And of course, we had our own MPs that took care of them. They uh, at the at the front. Uh, you, you get them, get them back as far as you can. Get them out of our way, so we don't have to have to uh, shoot them, you know, for because they're anxious to get away as we would be. And uh, there's no use making any more casualties than necessary. We were we, for all intent and purposes, were we pretty humane in our treatment? I thought so. I thought so. The only, the only Germans that I know that were outright shot uh, were, were those that parachuted in, you know. And I really don't know what happened to uh, all of them, but I understand there were some that were shot. But uh, they were in uh, American uniforms. They raised Cain, and, and now we had... Uh, we had a pretty good sized area, and uh, they dropped them in that area. And they would turn road signs around, you know, particularly disturbing, you know. You come to a road sign, and, hey, hey, it's supposed to go this way, but it's pointing that way type thing, you know, yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, That's pretty smart, I mean. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they. I remember I was up to Corps headquarters getting the SOI and SSI for uh, for the forthcoming period, and and uh, those are communication documents that uh, establish all kinds of things, cryptographic setups and frequencies and channels and all of that. And I went up there. Uh, 
and we got the word that the Germans had just dropped some paratroops in American uniform. So immediately the alert was heightened and uh, it was icy cold. Oh man, it was cold. You could hardly stay on the crown of the road with a four wheel drive. And I had uh, several kilometers to go to get back. And uh, I remember I came out of the gate of Fifth, uh, Fifth Corps headquarters and uh, was stopped. And the uh, guard came over and he put his icy hands down my neck <laughs> like this. <laughs> now, there was a, there was a, now I don't know whether he's a American or German, you know. That's the confusion. And uh, I had my forty-five out pointing at his belly, but he didn't know that. But I had a, a, a the, his partner had a grand pointed right at me. You know, we could have had a shootout there. <laughs> the OK Corral right there. Let me, I got to switch to You saw, you know, the interesting thing that I've discovered with a, with a lot of the veterans is you had probably the best geography lesson than... Uh, yeah, that's what you call terrain appreciation. Because <laughs> <laughs> like you said, you saw every... Major theater in Europe. Yeah. Um, so all these villages that you went through, and I mean, would you have ever known where any of those were? Wouldn't have cared. No. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I. We got pretty close. Now, you go through a, a German village, and and by the way, uh, they have what they call autobahns there. They were the they were the leaders of the world in freeways. And uh, they had beautiful autobahns. Well, we had taken care of uh, uh, their use for the Germans, for the most part, uh, by uh, blowing all the bridges, you know, bombing them. And uh, the, the Germans had taken care of the use by us by putting the 88s along the side. <laughs> so <laughs> we didn't use the autobahns. After the war, of course, we did, but but uh, we stayed to the side roads. We may parallel an autobahn, and and usually there was a route there. It's just like the secondary roads here, and, and it got so busy they put out an, a, a freeway on the thing. Same thing there, and so we would go out on these little villages, and. Uh, you can see why they built the Autobahn, because there's so many of the little villages, you know, and everybody else has to slow down and, and all that. Same problem here. Is it just a, um, when you're going along and you have all the tanks and all that, I mean, is it kind of like that earthquake yesterday when when, when you come into town, is it a rumbling and a shaking? Or? No, they just make a clattering noise on the thing. They're, they were, uh, we, we learned a long time ago uh, to have rubber treads on the uh, tanks. Uh, steel on, on concrete, not too good. I remember when I was in OCS at Fort Knox in, in uh, 42, uh, yeah, about uh, November of 42, I was in the second story of the uh, OCS barracks and uh, there was a main post road right underneath me and and uh, I, I heard the clatter of a tank they were steel treads I heard the clatter of the tank down there and then a crash and uh, I looked out the window and he'd run into the uh, the curbing and of course <laughs> smashed it flat and uh, he the driver panicked to have the tank panicked and he immediately backed up. What he didn't know is there was a jeep that had been right behind him, you know, and, and when that thing started to back up, the, the jeep driver just bailed out. And I'll tell you, it, it, uh, that poor jeep looked like a, like a beer can ready for recycle. <laughs> that tank passed over it. Oh, man. So we learned a long time ago to to use rubber.
on the roads. Uh, they, they wear better, the, the steel is just steel against concrete. And... So is most of your travel in Europe then uh, just following roadways? I mean, was that a lot of it when you were... Well, we, we went cross country. For example, uh, tanks don't fight too well in towns. And the reason is that uh, the Germans had the Panzerfaust, or bazookas. But uh, our bazooka is about that big around, you know, like this. Their bazooka is about this big around, <laughs> like this. And uh, it, it would take out a tank real easy. Uh, so you're real vulnerable, you come into a town and they're waiting for you to come down the lane or it's not now that one tank you have you have the shot where it, it's got uh, holes on both sides where it's gone where the, through. where the 88 went clear through it is that is that a bazooka or that's a, 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 off of uh, one of those that's an 88 88 okay yeah. a bazooka is a is a space charge in, in other words they they effectively cone the, the charge so that it penetrates at one spot and uh uh, th that that force then will will melt a small hole, but it's all molten metal on the inside, and it sets the tank on fire. And the uh, the M4 wasn't particularly uh, uh, good for being hit by a Panzerfaust. There. Later, we came out with some some good tanks. And of course, now we have the world's best with the Abrams, but it's too too big to run on roads. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Wow. Now, uh, you had um, some um, uh, some pictures of a, a gentleman uh, toasting a, a little brewski there, a little German beer. Huh. Uh, now, was that? That's me. Uh, now, was that <laughs> during or after the war? That was after the war. That's after I found that bombed out brewery. Yeah. So, so you're in you you're after the war. You're in some town, and and you started hunting around. The How did you find this? Well, uh, I was in there. That was Nordhausen, now, and I was in there with uh, some uh, uh, German t telephone engineers, trying to reestablish co telephone communication within uh, the town of Nordhausen, and uh, to, to everywhere if I if we could, but things were pretty well battered. And I kept seeing these people walking down to these gallons of something with fo foam on the top, you know. So uh, uh, I started conjecturing with my sergeant, you know, and I wonder what that is. It's precious enough to carefully carry it home. So uh, we backtracked them and we found a, a queue of people uh, between two bombed out buildings. The, the, the buildings themselves were absolutely level to the first floor, uh, except uh, the wall was about that high and that there was a window there and a red rubber hose about an inch and a half coming out of it. And there was a guy there uh, uh, pouring the beer into the jugs and, and uh, with a nozzle and, and uh, somebody collecting the money. They may not have had anything to do with the brewery, but they had a business going there. So uh, I just came back and, and uh, mentioned it to the staff, and so we we had beer. We we had a bar. <laughs> you you know we got a ration uh, during the war of uh, what two champagnes and a cognac or something. Uh, it it varied. I've had uh, some of the darnest liqueurs. I've I, I don't particularly care for drinking anyway, and and sweet drinking. So uh, they made it available to our, our bar. And uh, I noticed it had a foam on it, so it, uh, we must have charged it some way. <laughs> I don't know whether it had, there seemed to have a little head on it. Maybe they had some vats down. Uh, I, I stepped through that window where the rubber hose came out we got a flashlight and, and uh, started down, and I went down uh, four flights, and there was at least one more flight down below me. Uh, there was uh, two older gentlemen, gentlemen uh, on a two-man pump, pumping like this, you know. 
<laughs> they never stopped. Just kept going slow, you know, and puffing on a pipe, I think. Well, that's interesting. So, so you were in the, the village. Now we've destroyed their communication. We've gone and blown up their country during the war, and now we're back putting things back together. That was, that was the reason that I didn't take a grenade to some of their communications. I had, uh, I had instructions from Schaefe to preserve communications, not, not tear them up. And uh, as, insofar as possible, I did that. Only, only one switchboard did I ever cut a wire on it. And uh, that, the reason was <laughs> I couldn't read enough German to see where the switch was. <laughs> to turn it off, and it was just a t little tiny, tiny village. A couple of little cables about like my finger going into a switchboard. That's where the Germans were that uh, were in the courtyard. Incidentally, we stuck our... <laughs> after he ran the Germans out uh, of the house, uh, of course there's Germans going by the house to our, our rear uh, all the time. And um, so when we got ours out of there, we went into the courtyard. We talked it over, the sergeant and I, and, and uh, I wonder if we had any more back there. So uh, we uh, hollered something in German, and <laughs> we got about 20 more. <laughs> Isn't it? I mean, this is where, again, uh, war is kind of a... a, a a weird thing, because I've heard stories where the Germans are on one side of the river and the Americans were on another side of the river and they had agreed not to, they could wave at each other, and they agreed in that little village not to shoot at each yeah. other. They walk out of that village and they go back into to battle. Was it kind of like it, the news came, the war's over, and all of a sudden, okay? No. No fraternization. No fraternization. And... Uh, uh, the sad part of that was, and this this happened to this 12-year-old boy I told you at Wittenberg that became a, a, a elevator engineer later on and publishing my pictures and so on. Uh, he didn't know whether he had a mother or dad or any family at all. Uh, he was isolated. Uh, the Russians on one side of the river, at, and I don't know which side he was on, but anyway, uh, he was where we were at, in Wittenberg, and uh, he survived by uh, uh, swiping grub from us and, and anywhere else he could get it, you know. And uh, he, he sent me some very interesting stories about, about his activities at... Uh, but you got to remember, he was German, and in those pictures, and, and I didn't, I didn't bring these these particular ones. But those pictures were were uh, printed by this German in Germany uh, through a, a a third party who was the signal officer for the Fifth Armored Division, uh, now now dead. But uh, he had introduced me to this uh, this Carl Schwarzfeger, and uh, he assured me he was a man of integrity, and I'd get my my films back and so on. So based on that, I I sent my book of negatives, and I had at that time I had twelve hundred of them in there. Well. He, he was doing this all on, out of his pocket. Well, he must, I had so many, he, he got tired of printing them. Then he started printing some, <laughs> some that he had. For example, I got about uh, four or five pages there that shows an, an English bomber that was knocked down. And then at the end of the, of the four or five pages, there's a, there's a little picture of about uh, six or eight people that uh, manned that 88 that shot him down 
and there's a caption underneath it that this, this is the, 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 the proud gun crew that shot down the English bomber. <laughs> I thought that was cute, <laughs> you know, and so I, I looked for some of the pictures. I know I got I got a lot more of there, but he got tired. Of, he just got tired of printing them. And was that um, so? That was towards the end of the war. Yeah. Uh, he started printing. Did not did did he? This this is just recently. So he sent them back to you in the states. Yeah. He wow. he sent them back to the. I I sent them over to him. I. I, got, I started corresponding with him, and I still correspond with him. But uh, he was 40, he must be at least my age, got to be. Well, close close to it, because he was 12 years old when I was about, uh, he's about 10 years younger than I am, I guess. Yeah. So he, so when the war got done then, the Germans are trying to, Reestablish their lives in these villages, and you you're told, don't fraternize with them. Is that how the? That's right, no fraternization. That isn't to say that it didn't go on. It's just that uh, it it wasn't accepted. Uh, you know, it, it in now in Holland, uh, I I was sent to, right right after uh, the. Uh, Battle of the Bulge, why I, I was sent uh, up to, uh, through Aachen, which had just been taken from the Germans, and uh, I went through it, and there was still sniping going on, and when I got, uh, uh, when we got through it all right, right after we got through, they took it back, and there was, so there was a delay. I was, I was to go ahead to a, a little town called Hurle Heide Holland and occupy the town and, and put my communications out. I was always the billeting officer, and, uh, <laughs> which is kind of cute too because I remember one, one time there was a big long line of houses and uh, you know they seemed to get progressively better as, as they went down the line. Of course, I gave the colonel the best house, and I took number two. <laughs> has some power in that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but but uh, I, I took this uh, wire crew up to Hurley High Holland, and we drove around. And, and uh, after looking the town over, and it wasn't very big, they decided that uh, they would like to live in the upstairs hall room over a tavern. <laughs> okay, so I went in and made arrangements for him. And uh, uh, English is a secondary language in Holland, and only the grand grandparents didn't speak English. And uh, I drove up the road uh, after dropping the crew off and, and uh, saw a little gal there, and, and I said, uh, do you know where I might find a room here? We're going to be coming in here. And, and uh, she said, just a minute, I'll ask my mother. And uh, by golly, uh, she came back out and says, yes, we have a room for you. <laughs> Would you believe it was a double bed? I, I mean, a queen-size bed. First one I ever saw. You know, beautiful. The, uh, the young boy, he was probably about uh, 21, 22, worked for the Dutch Underground. And uh, he'd be away on his little missions. Now and then, I don't know what he was blowing up, but, <laughs> but uh, they are real lovely people. And I corresponded with them till uh, either they died off or got married and changed names or something. And but I corresponded for years with them there. You know, nice people. Did Did you realize? Because again, I mean, names that for me are history book names. Mm -hmm. Did you realize, as a young kid going to fight for America, when you stepped off that boat on those beaches, that you were <laughs> in something that was a part of history? I couldn't care less about history. I was scared to death. <laughs> uh, you got to remember, I had a knob on my head, a heading, throbbing headache, you know, <laughs> from hitting the, the steel deck, and. Uh, 
I didn't feel too good. And besides that, uh, the, the, uh, there was an air attack. That's why we had to get off the ship. And uh, you, you could, you could uh, drive about 30 miles an hour on that beach just by the light of the anti-aircraft. See, every one of the, of the ships that were knocked out that uh, could accommodate an anti-aircraft gun, they put them on it. And so that was, it, the whole place was just live with flak. Wow. You know, what goes up comes down. You know, so I kind of pulled it over my head and, and hoped. Because that's we lost people to friendly fire in that way. Yeah, you bet. Like that. You bet. Yeah. Particularly with uh, artillery, where they got large chunks of razor sharp flak. Yeah. What do, you, do you think that there's that the history books are leaving things out? Well, <laughs> the, when you talk about history books, I, I've got quite a quite a library myself of of uh, World War II stuff, and. Uh, some do, some don't. Uh, some are good, some aren't. I will say that Tom Brokaw's the, the greatest generation. I think that was uh, was one of the better ones. I get a little emotional. Uh, this uh, Finding Private Ryan uh, showed some of the action shots. Uh, you can jolly well bet that they wouldn't be sending seven or eight people to find somebody uh, in a war zone because of all the mines. And uh, the Germans were real... They were real good at putting out minefields. Uh, I never looked at uh, being the greatest generation. Never. Begin to now, you know, I can see the... We just went to work. I, uh, I went in two years ahead of everybody else, but uh, I learned from it and uh, gave me enough courage to go to OCS and do a lot of other things, you know. I'll tell you, it wasn't my idea to go into a German town all by myself, and, you know, without a tank or two behind me. Never would have done that. So I, I, I guess we did what we had to do, and so did everybody else. My wife worked uh, before uh, we got married. She worked in a plywood plant, flipping uh, four by eight three-quarter inch sheets of plywood, you know. Everybody did their part, didn't they? Yeah. It was different. It, it just sounds like such a, a, a different time, I mean, for what America stood for, where America... Yeah. Right now, everybody would ask, what are we doing there? And it's a pretty good question. At that time, if we hadn't been, uh, we would have been in deep trouble because it was only a matter of time that they got a hold of that nuclear warhead and with the delivery system. And they had a delivery system. So, yeah, they put another booster on that thing. They probably could have gone another 5,000 miles. Did you, uh, did you lose friends in that? <laughs> Not too many. 
uh, I was in a higher headquarters, fortunately. And uh, we weren't the first ones in. With one exception, that was me. <laughs> but I made it, you know, on the thing. I never asked. Uh, now, I, the the fact that all of this staff came from a Third Armored Group and became the the balance of the staff for uh, CCR, a Fifth Armored Division, meant that uh, they had lost those people. And I never had the courage to ask what happened to the communication officers they used to have. I just avoided the subject like that. And uh, I, don't, I don't know what happened to him. I hope he wasn't doing the thing, thing I was doing. But uh, anyway, it worked, and it, and it was very effective. And the old colonel was uh, so tickled that he, like I say, he gave me a prawn star for doing it, you know, which isn't any big thing, but it's uh, it's an award, and that that little little award uh, got me home a lot sooner than a lot of other people because I had five points more, okay, automatically. Uh, they gave points for uh, each battle you were in. Like I say, I was all five of them. And uh, the number of months of service and the, the, the years you put in and so on and all, all came out. And, and I don't remember what the total was now and it don't make a difference, but it's, uh, I was five points above everybody else. <laughs> going home. Yeah, going home. Yeah. What did you do when you got out of the service? Uh, well, I went to work for the telephone company, matter of fact. My mother was the long-distance chief operator in Tacoma. And uh, she'd worked there for years and years and years. And uh, they liked telephone families. And uh, so I, I went through a, a uh, I didn't want to be a lineman, but they said that's where you start. So uh, I took an apprenticeship in, in uh, climbing poles. Of course, I, I knew how to climb a pole. <laughs> But, uh, like they met them when they weren't shooting at you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we never had, and we never lost, I never lost a man. I come so close. We had, a, we had uh, messengers travel in twos. That's why the second, uh, the machine gun on the co pilot side. And uh, they, if they run across something that calls for a firefight, they'll give them a firefight. And uh, one time we were at an airport, and uh, one of the messengers captured some Germans. Well, they were they were off to the not at the main main uh, uh, buildings, but uh, they were off to one of the side buildings, and uh, Barry took the. Uh, the prisoners down downstairs in the building, and uh, the other the other guy saw some Germans running over there, and instead of man in the machine gun, uh, he jumped in the jeep and drove off. I left him there, and uh, he don't know how close he come to being court martial for that one. So. Uh, as it turned out, the next day our tanks overran the place, and, and there was Barry, and he had about a dozen prisoners. And there, he'd been sitting up all night; he didn't move. <laughs> and all the they're just waiting for him to fall asleep, of course. You see, that would keep you, yeah, that'd keep you awake. Yeah, it, it puts an edge on things. Yeah. <laughs> do, do you think there's um, looking ahead to generations to, to come that you and I'll never meet? A message that we need to leave with them uh, from World War II or about World War II. Well, learn all you can. War is going to be different. Now, during World War II, we didn't have any helicopters. 
would have made a world of difference in pickup of uh, uh, for the wounded, for example. Uh, they're not too sharp for observation uh, uh, because they're relatively slow, you know. And heck, a uh, guy can take care of some of them, but, but they pack a punch. Holy crying out loud, they pack a punch. That Apache will... Uh, oh, yeah. Wow. You know. Those, those things uh, have the uh, a machine gun that uh, is... Uh, uh, is moved by th his sight. Yep. And wherever he looks, that machine gun's pointing. So all I have to do is look there and, and kick it off. And it's like a lawnmower. Yeah. I mean, it'll... Um, are you proud of your service? Proud of it. Yeah, I went through, you've only heard part of it. I went through uh, the Korean thing too. But uh, I, I said in 1949, I went down and took the basic in aircraft and guided missile course. I had to, to stay in an aircraft if I was gonna be an anti-aircraft officer. And uh, then in 1950, I got uh, called up for a two-year tour. And I immediately applied and received uh, permission to go to the advanced anti-aircraft and guided missile course. And uh, they're the ones that plan and make operational your anti-aircraft defenses. And so, uh, while I was there at uh, Fort Bliss, they asked me to stay there and write uh, technical manuals and field manuals. And uh, I like to write, so I was going to do it. And along came our second lieutenant as advanced detachment, and they, were, they had sent us down from Fort Lewis to Georgia. Now they were sending us back to Fort Lewis. And uh, so when I found out they were going back home, I. I said, no, thanks anyway, and, and uh, I graduated from that. I went up to Fort Lewis, and they immediately sent me up to uh, to uh, Seattle, Fort Lawton. And uh, they had already uh, started and were completing, uh, putting a million, two million, three million uh, dollars in quarters and buildings and things up there for us, putting a 14-foot uh, cyclone fence around it and guard towers and the whole bit. And they gave me the key. And uh, I made the place operational. I worked, uh, I worked with civilian contractors. I worked with a telephone uh, company directly with them and became good friends with the telephone engineer. Uh, that was in charge of our, our project, and uh, his dad was in charge of the, all the telephones in Seattle, <laughs> Bill McKay. And uh, we, we had direct contact with uh, RADCOM, that's Army and Aircraft Defense Center. We had indirect uh, uh, contact with the, the dew line, or the, yeah, the dew line, uh, up in uh, the Arctic, wow. up there, and uh, I I became friends with uh, Captain George Hennish, who was the uh, communication officer for the GCI station, Ground Control Intercept at uh, McCord Field, and uh, we set up a mutual arrangement. He was looking for a uh, for a radio channel from Blake Island down to McCord Field to the GCI. And uh, I wanted to put uh, some, um, some of my men up in the GCI station to tell to us all the plots that came down from the dew line. And I, I set up a system in uh, my uh, op, op center there that uh, from the time the message was received at McCord Field, it would be down to the gun units in three seconds. On thing. Wow. Can't beat that. For which I 
got a commendation. 